Jeff. Um, as you probably saw the email traffic this week, um, we had to uh, uh, replace uh, a keynote speaker just because uh, Heather McGowan, our original keynote, had um, a health emergency. I am happy to report um, that she has made it through and is in stable condition, um, but you know, uh, keep, please keep her in, in your thoughts. Um, but also I want to recognize Jeff because Jeff really stepped up to help us and you know, not only uh, stepped in at the last minute, but also was the last flight out of DC, which is kind of like the last helicopter out of Saigon, as I hear, um, you know, to, to get here today to be with us. And so I uh, really appreciate um, him coming to this organization and presenting. So with that, I will turn it over to Brandon and uh, let him introduce Jeff. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. RTA is once again proud to sponsor the uh, keynote opening here for the summit. Uh, just a quick uh, spiel on RTA. We are the region's public transportation provider, and economic development is really at the core of what we do. Over 70% of our customers, 30,000 customers a day, are traveling to and from jobs. Uh, it's critical what we do for the economy here and what we deliver to the community. I want to note that RTA is currently undergoing a total network redesign, and everybody in this room uh, has input in on that, and I'd encourage you to visit our table outside to get more information. This will affect the future of our region. As jobs continue to grow in this region, it's important to ensure that public transportation is a part of the conversation to ensure job access for those individuals. So I'd encourage you to meet with our staff that's out at the table, get more information, and provide feedback as everyone's feedback matters in developing what the future of our network will be within this region. So I'd like to introduce Jeff Finkel. As the President and CEO of the International Economic Development Council, Jeff is a recognized leader and authority on economic development. With the formation of the IEDC in 2001 following the merger of the Council for Urban Economic Development, where he was president for 15 years and the American Economic Development Council, Jeff set the course for a more effective and influential organization. Today, IEDC is the world's largest economic development membership organization and is a six million annual operation that is renowned for its leadership in professionalizing and diversifying the field of economic development. Jeff previously served as Deputy Assistant Secretary to, in the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and has received numerous awards over the years for his commitment to making sustainable economic development a priority in communities of all sizes. Significantly, in 2011, he was lauded by the U.S. Department of Commerce for his 25 years of stewardship over CUED and IECD. Moreover, as a longtime leader in the community, service and philanthropy, in 2005, Jeff organized 250 economic development volunteers to work in the Gulf Coast communities, endeavoring to recovery from Hurricane Katrina. And today, IEDC is deploying volunteers in Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Puerto Rico, Northern Marian Islands, Hawaii, Texas, after various hurricanes, floods, and volcano incidents. In 1989, he also founded the Bollinger Foundation, a nonprofit organization that provides financial assistance to children who have lost a parent who worked in the field of economic development. A frequent lecturer and author of numerous articles, Jeff has appeared on CBS Sunday Morning, Fox Television, The Journal Report on PBS, and most recently quoted several times in the Wall Street Journal on the Amazon HQ2 decision. He received a Bachelor of Science degree in Communications in 1976 from Ohio University in Athens and pursued graduate studies in Business Administration at The Ohio State University. He maintains a strong connection with Ohio University's Voinovich School for Leadership in Public Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeff. You're going to have to bear with me a minute. I've got to see if I can uh, get a presentation. Fantastic. Good morning. You know, I, I want to say that it's wonderful being here, but um, 
You know, it's tough to say that after a place has just gone through the havoc that uh, you guys have, have just experienced uh, here. And, um, and unfortunately, um, that's become kind of a, a second uh, profession for me, uh, is uh, uh, helping communities think through what happens after a disaster. Um, if I were in a joking mood, I'd say I'm the master of disaster. Um, but um, let, I, I do want to, before I uh, jump into the presentation today, I do want to talk about uh, what you just experienced. And, and, and at the end of the day, um, one of the things that's becoming painfully aware to those of us in the economic development community is that these incidents seem to be coming with greater frequency, uh, with greater uh, devastation, and they hit us no matter where we are. Um, I was a sophomore at Ohio University uh, in a dormitory, and on one side of the hall was the men's uh, dorms, and the other side of the hall were the women's dorms in 1974, and there was a girl over on the other side of the dorm from Xenia, Ohio. I remember spending the whole night up uh, with this young lady as she tried to figure out what had happened to her parents. And I think that was the first time uh, that the whole issue of disasters uh, kind of uh, came home to me. I did not know that later in my career I would be actually working on them um, on, on a more regular basis. We have started to teach in our economic development courses the fact that uh, these things do happen and that you do need to be prepared in some way. Um, I joke about Galveston, Texas. You know, Galveston sits in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, it's kind of sitting out there. And I, and I say that they have this sign. This is not true. Um, and it's facing the, the Gulf, and it says, just hit me. We're ready. Just hit me. And frankly, they do get hit. Um, and, uh, but they're ready. Um, they're not, they're not going to be completely ready if a more devastating uh, hurricane comes ashore there. Uh, but they already have a revolving loan fund set up uh, to assist businesses. The local banks, local insurance companies have already set up, and it's a large fund. And they have loan documents, um, and some of them can be turned into grants, but they will not have to wait for the federal government to show up in order to help resolve those issues. Uh, they're, they're prepared to hand out money from day one. Now, I'm, I'm going into this, you know, going kind of off script, and Eric and I talked about this this morning, um, because this is going to test you all. Uh, it's going to test you as a community. It's going to test you as a region. And uh, the big test is going to be how much money are you going to get from the federal government? And is it going to be the right money? And do you have the right political leadership in, in place um, in order to make the sure this is going to happen? And I'm not, I'm not taking a pot shot at your US senators or your congressmen, your mayor, your county commissioners. But um, I will tell you that it's been my experience, and I've been working around disasters since 2005. And I will, I'll digress for a minute. In 2005, we had the largest disaster to ever hit the shores of the United States, and that was Katrina hitting uh, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, and a part of Alabama. Nothing had ever come ashore. Nothing had destroyed as much property. Nothing had killed as many people as Katrina did when it, it hit in 2005. IEDC had never responded in a way like we did uh, in Katrina. And there were a lot of organizations that woke up and said, is there something we can do? Uh, well, we did something. And we continue to do those somethings. Now, I'd, uh, it is, uh, it's not completely charitable. Most of our expenses are paid for uh, by the Economic Development Administration uh, when we send people into the field. But it takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of preparation. And it takes a mobilized uh, membership um, in, in order for people to go as volunteers um, to these locations. We're able to cover everyone's expenses. 
uh, but we, uh, we send volunteers to these various places. Um, we sent, as was said in the introduction, nearly 250 uh, volunteers into the region uh, to help do economic recovery. I don't know anything about pumping out water. I don't know anything about rebuilding uh, uh, infrastructure. But what our members know how to do is think about, you know, w once a, a, a plant closes, a shopping center closes, a shopping center is hit, uh, downtown is hurt, our members know economic development. They know the steps that's necessary to, uh, to get those businesses back up and running. They know how to, uh, to fill vacancies. They know how to make connections with uh, workforce agencies and, and, and create jobs. Um, so fast forward to, to what we're talking about today. Um, each and every one of these major disasters that we deal with um, ends up getting some uh, federal money. Uh, frankly, states aren't set up to provide uh, uh, resources. Uh, you will end up um, getting community development block grant DR money into this region, which stands for disaster recovery. Hopefully, uh, you will get EDA money. Hopefully, you'll get some infrastructure money. Uh, SBA probably is uh, on its way here if they aren't already here and setting up a center to meet with local business people. But mark my word, the money that is coming today is not enough. And as a region, as a community, you need to make a wish list. That wish list needs to end up in the hands of the governor. The governor will be handing a wish list to your uh, con congressional delegation. The congressional delegation will be handing a wish, wish list to the White House. You need to be quite specific in terms of what do you want. How much CDBGDR money are you going to need? How much EDA money? And by the way, uh, EDA is the most flexible economic development money you can ask for. In most states, uh, the number that is being uh, requested ends up being in the three to six hundred million dollars statewide on some of the big disasters. Now I don't know, frankly, I haven't seen the numbers in terms of what's going on in Ohio, uh, in terms of how you rank against what's happened in Florida or Texas or North Carolina or the Northern Mariana Islands or, or Puerto Rico or, or Virgin Islands, which is where we are currently deploying volunteers. But, uh, you know, you're, you're going to need as a community to come together uh, and, and come up with uh, some type of assessment. Think boldly. Um, you know, the, the numbers you'll put together should be high. And somebody at some point will have to say, we can't really submit this much. But you really ought to say, you know, what is it that you need to, uh, uh, what, what are those numbers you think that will not be covered by private insurance, uh, will not be covered, uh, you know, by other sources of funding. It is time to put your numbers together and, uh, and go forward. I wish you luck because, uh, and, and patience, because this takes a long time. Um, it was funny, as, uh, um, as Michael was talking about me being on the last uh, helicopter out of Saigon, I was trying to figure out, is it because Washington's burning? Uh, is it because Mueller issued his report yesterday? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly why I should have been helicoptering out of Washington. There's probably lots of reasons every day to do so. Uh, but I will point out, um, watch what's going on right now with the disaster supplemental. The, co the Congress is now trying to respond uh, to some of the events that occurred last year. Two congressmen have held up $19 billion in emergency supplemental dollars for disaster recovery. Th that is what you're going to expect uh, because this, is, this becomes a game to some people and, and unfortunately not a game to those communities that are waiting on the money but some game for somebody for, you know, for their political uh, day in the, in the, on the headlines. Um, and, and frankly, you know, what will happen is you will be wrapped up in some type of disaster emergency supplemental later in the year. It won't come quickly. 
Your FEMA money will come quickly. The SBA will be here with sufficient dollars uh, to, to, um, to provide loans. But remember, those are loans. Those are not grants. Uh, for you to be able to provide grants, you need CDB, GDR, you need EDA, um, you need other types of funding to, to go forward. So let me go to uh, uh, the presentation that uh, I was asked to give today. And I will go through some of this pretty quickly because I just burned a pretty good hole in, in my presentation. And by the way, you know, there are, uh, you know, kind of Ohio's one of the, you know, the two big homes of presidents. Uh, you know, we have uh, as many uh, presidents of the United States from Ohio. Dayton's the, the home of IEDC presidents. Uh, uh, Gary Conley and Steve Budd, uh, for those of you who uh, remember both of them, Steve's not uh, been gone that long. Uh, uh, we're both presidents of, the, of our organization. Jerry Brunswick, I saw a little earlier uh, this morning, he was uh, on our board of directors uh, uh, from Dayton. Um, so Dayton has been an important place uh, for IEDC uh, uh, for quite some period of time. I'm counting on Ford Weber being a, key, a big speaker at our, uh, at our annual conference. I uh, have his book sitting on my desk and uh, um, and I'm, I've, I've enjoyed reading what portions of it I've had so far. So I'm going to run through what are the trends in economic development organizations and uh, what's going on in the world that, that we, uh, we know is in economic development. For those of you who don't know much about IEDC, and I hope that's no one in this room, uh, we are the professional association for the people who work in the field of economic development. Uh, the, uh, we have members who work for public-private partnerships like the Dayton Development Coalition, uh, cities, counties uh, like uh, uh, Trotwood, the city of Dayton, Xenia, uh, Montgomery County, and, and some of the other counties. Um, we have uh, utility companies. I, I heard Vectoran is one of your uh, uh, sponsors. Our annual conference, and I. I, I'll probably repeat this eight or nine times. You can drive to our annual conference this year. We're going to be in Indianapolis. Uh, you can almost sleep here at home and go over every day. Uh, uh, Indianapolis, October, everybody. Uh, anyhow, uh, so uh, Vectran's one of our uh, keynote speakers. Uh, you know, some of the Ben Franklin Partnership programs, Edison Centers have, have been our, our members of IEDC, uh, and some of the educational institutions. We do what every association does. We hold conferences. We, uh, um, we train people. We accredit organizations. Uh, we have a program called uh, the AEDO, the Accredited Economic Development Organization. We certify people. Man, uh, many of our members are certified economic developers. We have about 5,200 members. About 20% of our members uh, have gone through a certification process, newsletters, quarterly journal, uh, public policy advocacy. Um, what, what's uh, fun about being in this job is we are the largest economic development membership organization in the world. You, you don't think about it that way until you all of a sudden you look at all the other organizations in the, in the, in the world. URADA, the European Association Development Agency, four or five hundred members. We're five thousand members. Uh, we would be eclipsed in a heartbeat if China actually had a membership organization. They don't, so we win. Um, so, uh, uh, oh, there, uh, I, I wrote this later in the slide. I'd ask somebody to put this slide in. Uh, other than our annual conference that will uh, follow uh, uh, these two training programs, we'll also have two training programs over in Indianapolis. Did, I, did you remember we're having an annual conference in Indianapolis in October? Uh, uh, we'll have two training programs that precede our annual conference. Uh, economic development credit analysis and our real estate uh, course will be over there. So let me tell you quickly, and, and I'm going to try to run through this as, as fast as possible, and somebody give me a five minute before you want me off here, okay? Uh, we do an annual survey. Uh, we call it the Trends in Economic Development Organizations. And, uh, this survey typically goes out late November, early December to all of our members, uh, uh, and we have some international members. And we ask them, what's going on in your life? Uh, what's going on with your organization? What's going on with your budget? What are the things that are keeping, up to you, uh, uh, keeping you up at night? And what uh, kind of industry sectors uh, 
um, are you chasing? One of the questions we ask is, what's going on with your budget? Is it going up? Is it going down? Staying the same? 47% uh, of our members say their budget is pretty stable at this point. Uh, remember, we started this survey uh, around 2008. Couldn't have uh, happened at a worse time. You know, the economy is tanking in a big way at that point. So, you know, almost everybody uh, was saying their budget was going down. Um, uh, 39% uh, of our members, I think, are telling us that we're getting an increase, uh, and 14% uh, of our members are having a decreased budget. Um, so uh, what's going on, and, and where are people spending uh, uh, their money? And the, they're spending it on increased staff pay. They've hired more staff. They've increased advertising and marketing spending. Um, and 10% uh, more of our members are, are spending more money than they were before. Where are, they send, uh, where are they spending their efforts? They're spending it in a couple different ways. Foreign direct investment and workforce are probably the two areas of economic development spending uh, that they've increased the most. And uh, by the way, obviously, this does not uh, uh, add up to 100%. This is a uh, there's got to be a better way to show this than, than we do. But these are areas where people um, have, in fact, uh, increased spending. And by the way, I'm going to leave a copy of this uh, presentation uh, uh, with uh, uh, Mike, and uh, he, can, he can send this out to everybody after the fact, so you don't have to, uh, 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 you know, take pictures of it. By the way, the fastest growing job in economic development is somebody who has a title that's dealing in workforce. Vice President of Talent Attraction, uh, Vice President of Talent Management. Uh, that person is not necessarily replacing your Workforce Investment Board, uh, but what they're doing is they're taking questions from your local businesses. Uh, if they're growing and they need employees, they're acting as a liaison. Uh, frankly, and I apologize if I'm stepping on anybody's toes, WIBs are hard to talk to. Uh, and, uh, and so economic developers seem to be able to, to translate better uh, with the business community, and so we've seen these jobs popping up uh, all across the country. Um, two, new effort, two, two new areas that uh, have grown significantly in our survey for about 2018, workforce housing. Now, there are two reasons that workforce housing uh, have grown. And, and one of it is, is wages have not kept up uh, as we've come out of this recession. And there are a lot of people where their paycheck is not performing for them in the way uh, that it needs to. And so they're complaining they cannot either be close to work, afford a house. And so communities aren't addressing the wage issue. They're dealing with the cost issue, and that's the cost of housing. So many communities are, are starting to focus on the workforce housing side. The other area that we're seeing more organizations focused on is downtown development. Which industries did your community primarily focus its business recruitment efforts on? Without question, advanced manufacturing was number one. Um, healthcare, for a whole variety of demographic reasons, uh, is, is up there, but advanced manufacturing is uh, um, uh, is, is number one. Logistics took the biggest tumble uh, between what we saw in 17 and, and 2018. And, and frankly, um, over time, we're going to see logistics tumbling further and further. As the transportation industry figures out how to uh, make our truck links longer and put fewer people in the cabs, because at some point we're going to have some of that uh, self-driving vehicles, we're going to see the numbers of people in the transportation and logistics uh, world start to decline. I'm not sure we're going to see that for another five or six years, but we are going to see it. I mean, already on some of our major turnpikes, they're, they're allowing trucks to run with uh, three trailers, um, and it, it kind of depends on the state where those things are going on. But the uh, logistic jobs are, are starting to decline. Aerospace, food processing, biosciences were specifically mentioned in the advanced manufacturing area of where communities are, um, are trying to grow. I have a, a kind of a funny statement about uh, clusters. 
I get calls from reporters from time to time, and, and, and the region will go through, and they'll say, hey, we just went through a strategic planning, and we're focused on these clusters. We want to see how we uh, stack up against other communities. And I says, stop. Let me guess what your clusters are. Um, you're talking about clean energy. You're talking about uh, health care. You're talking about uh, uh, information technology, IT. Uh, you are, and then, you know, there'll be one or two others, education efforts. And then if there's a local cluster, Hollywood in, in Los Angeles, Boeing in, uh, in Seattle. But frankly, unfortunately, our, our sectors have hollowed out a little bit as we've jettisoned jobs to places like China uh, that we um, are not as diverse uh, in our approach. The last time I spoke here, by the way, uh, you guys just opened an RFID uh, incubator. And I said, at last, a different cluster uh, than I am hearing in other places around the country. Is that incubator doing OK? Anybody? No? Well, so yes and no. I'm, get, I'm getting uh, uh, two answers here. One of the questions we started asking in 2008 uh, is, was your economic development organization uh, partnering with anybody. By the way, in 2008, the numbers were pretty bad. They weren't, uh, we weren't partnering with anybody as a profession. Uh, we were trying to hold all of everything to ourselves. Uh, today, um, and I think the recession was pretty brutal on some of our organizations, we figured out how to play well, better with others. We tend to partner a little bit quicker, and we let others do things where they have a real uh, either strategic advantage or some real... Uh, capabilities that our organizations won't do, uh, can't do. So our partnership statistics have grown significantly um, uh, since 2008. Who did we partner with? Chambers, universities, workforce development partners, uh, regional EDOs if we were a local, private sector and foundations, state EDO, local associations. Oh, by the way, uh, let's go back to what I said at the beginning of this presentation and talking about disasters. This is a time for your local foundations to step up as well. There is a whole uh, set of foundations in Washington, D.C. who, they, they're not necessarily Washington, D.C. based, uh, but they come together. Uh, there's a group called uh, uh, Disaster Funders uh, that when a disaster occurs, uh, uh, these funders have figured out how to work together around certain aspects of, of responding uh, to disaster. Um, we found that the economic development world uh, does tend to partner with a whole bunch of different educational institutions. Our favorite partner as economic developers, however, is community colleges. Bar none, without question, uh, community colleges seem to come to the rescue uh, when we are working with a business of, of some sort or another. However, let me put an asterisk next to that. Um, there are uh, uh, community colleges that have got it figured out, and there are community colleges that don't. Um, and l let me give you uh, specifically what I'm talking about there. Let's say you have a company, needs 30 new welders. Uh, and you go, to the community, you go to the community college that is the great partner, and you say, we need 30 welders. Can you help us? And they'll say, we'll start a welding class next week. Perfect. You're off to the races. You're going to meet the needs of this particular business. Talk about a community college that doesn't get it. They'll say, we've got a course starting in September, and uh, we'll be happy to, uh, to uh, make sure that we have enough openings and our faculty will be back from their summer vacation at that particular point in time. That's a community college that doesn't get it. And in fact, opens the door for private sector vendors of educational services uh, to, to step in, who won't necessarily be a reliable partner all the time to you, but will uh, uh, come in and, and, and steal uh, good uh, companies from your ability to help them from time to time. Not that that's... Uh, you know, having an alternative supplier of services is certainly a good thing, 
uh, but you want a community college that can step up and, and be a great partner in this. Um, one of the questions that we've been asking for about the last four or five years is this whole question about equitable distribution of wealth. Um, you know, we went through a strategic planning process uh, four or five years ago, and um, our economic developers were for the first time uh, hearing that uh, the whole issue of equity um, and how the economy was treating certain parts of our uh, economy or populations uh, was we were not doing well. And so IEDC has been doing a number of things to, to talk about equity. We've uh, done a couple of reports on it. We, uh, at our annual conference in Cleveland, uh, what, three years ago, it, it was a major theme. We've continued to have uh, sessions about equity. And, and there's some simple questions for those of us who are in the economic development business. Who is going to benefit from our services? You know, our job is to create, retain, expand jobs, develop tax base, and enhance wealth. Who gets wealthy? Are we working towards the, the wealthy owners, or are we working for people that are transitioning into jobs? Is it uh, uh, particular neighborhoods? I'm not going to tell you how you do your job, but I hope that you, uh, when you're thinking about your economic development outcomes, that you are thinking about those questions and, and frankly, who is going to be the recipients of, uh, of uh, the, the work that you do. And I will tell you that, uh, and I will talk about it a little further in here, economic development is probably struggling in some ways right now. We're being attacked in some places. We're being attacked on the political right because we're picking winners and losers. We're uh, uh, providing corporate welfare. We're being attacked on the left uh, because when we put incentives into businesses and they don't hire people um, at the lower ends of the income scale, they're saying, well, why would we uh, provide tax breaks to businesses who are not providing jobs to people who need them most? Uh, as a result, um, we're, we're seeing uh, in Texas, economic development's under significant attack. In Florida, they wanted to cap the wages of economic developers. They wanted to cap uh, their ability to uh, spend money on expenses. Uh, we're seeing all types of, of bizarre stuff. Uh, but part of it is uh, the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we being intentional about what we do um, uh, in our economic development efforts? Uh, we asked what the people's priorities were, the top three priorities in 2019. Uh, attraction, retention, and workforce training. Uh, a talent attraction, as I indicated earlier, is, uh, uh, has been on the run uh, for some time. If you go back to 2008 or 2009, um, uh, access to capital, uh, there was no money to be uh, had for any almost business venture at that point. The banks were frozen. Um, we've moved uh, to that to where we have 3.6, 3.7% unemployment rate across the country, and, and so talent is an issue. In 2018, if you were trying to be in a business incentive, uh, did you run into political uh, issues? 38% of our members uh, uh, said they did have problems. Uh, they did have some political uh, pushback that was significant. 62% did not. Look at what happened. Amazon HQ2 in New York. Uh, that was a incentive deal that just kind of blew up on their face. Um, you know, they did not have their uh, uh, political ducks in a row, and, and, and it became uh, too easy a target. Another thing we've been asking our members about is, are they thinking about the world as it's going to be in the future? Are they, are bu are they building uh, staff diversity? Um, you know, uh, gender, race, demographics of various ways. You know, um, if you looked at an IEDC picture in 1950, or it was depending, uh, would be AEDC at that point, it was all men in the room. Uh, if you look today, uh, we probably have 40% women uh, in, in our conferences. And, and uh, you know, it took a while, but I now have Latino board members. Um, African American uh, leaders have been active in IEDC for some time. Uh, but over time, uh, you know, I would like to think that we're leading the profession uh, 
in terms of what the complexity of my board of directors is, but the question you have to ask is, what does your staff look like? And in fact, what does your board look like? Um, uh, the world is changing, and are we changing uh, along the way? Performance measures. Uh, how are we uh, uh, dealing with economic development performance? I think if we were sitting in a room 15 years ago, um, people would say, you know, Jerry, you were sitting in those rooms 15 years ago with me. Uh, did we even know what a performance measurement would look like at that particular point in time? Sure, we might say that we created X number of jobs. Um, the bad joke that I use sometimes, you know what the definition of an economic developer is? They see a parade and they jump in front of it. Uh, and, and there are people that do that. They, uh, they, will, they will take credit for things they probably shouldn't be taking credit for. Um, and I think uh, if we went back 15 years ago, that might have been, uh, you know, you'd have four different organizations taking credit for the same jobs and, and the same project. Today, we've got to be a lot better than that. Uh, our investors, our city councils, our, uh, our board of directors are expecting m much better uh, measurements than, we had bef uh, than we've had in the past. Uh, succession planning. There's a lot of people in our industry that look like me, gray-haired and, and aging. Uh, and uh, uh, so a number of organizations uh, are, are having to think about what is their succession planning. Uh, do they have a succession plan in place and, and how are they going to bring the next generation leadership ab aboard in their organizations? I can't, uh, it, it astounds me that many of my contemporaries and uh, are, uh, you know, uh, thinking about, you know, where they're going to winter these days as opposed to, uh, you know, how are they going to fulfill their budget needs for, uh, for the following year. Uh, over 70% of EDOs don't have a succession plan in place. How do you develop leadership skills within your organization? Um, most people are doing that externally. Uh, um, you know, we ask people, are, are they trying to get their staff certified? Uh, there, there's probably a little bit of bias built into this question because uh, IEDC does in fact have a certification. Uh, does your organization uh, plan to become accredited? Um, we, there are about 70 organizations in the United States that are accredited. Um, my guess is within the next uh, two to three years we'll be at 100. It's probably our fastest growing program, people that want to benchmark themselves uh, against other organizations. Uh, when we ask the question, what are some of the most difficult issues that uh, economic development organizations are dealing with, and the, uh, a the answer comes back to us frequently, it's the naivete of their uh, local elected officials. They, uh, you know, I, I talk about the fast-growing suburb from time to time, and, and you have a, a newly elected city council member. What did they know about economic development? Well, they know whatever their local housing real estate agent told them about economic development. That does none of us any good. Uh, we have to figure out how are we going to train those local elected officials to understand what are those business needs that our, uh, our businesses are dealing with, what are the problems with transportation. It's, it's great that RTA is a, uh, a sponsor because a lot of people can't get jobs because of transportation. Uh, what are those workforce housing needs that you might have? Um, and so uh, if you don't have a plan or a methodology for training your local elected officials, it's probably time to think about that. Um, so how would you rate your organization's outlook for economic development activity for 2019? 54% uh, of our members uh, think it's better than it was in, in 2000. Um, uh, 18, about 41% uh, is about the same. And some places are having problems, and we don't have to go very far. Uh, well, you've got a couple counties in, in southern Ohio uh, who are losing their power plants. And uh, those communities uh, that are losing those power plants are going to lose their largest tax base, some of their better paying employers. So we, clearly, it's places like that that uh, um, are not looking. Uh, um, at uh, good times. Uh, challenges to economic development. There's some 
uh, people that are saying, hey, our economy is booming, we don't need to do much economic development right now. Um, you know, what are you doing for me lately? Look at that low unemployment rate. You know, frankly, I would like to think of economic development as a counter-cyclical activity, meaning we ought to have better budgets uh, when times are bad, and, and now we probably could op uh, operate with, uh, uh, well, we need a lot of staff to, to work on the projects that are coming at us fast and furious, but we need to be spending more money uh, at a time when things are worse. The, re the political reality is we'll never get those funds um, because uh, you would go into your city manager or your mayor or your county uh, government and they'd say, now I'm going to put more money into economic development. You're going to run around the country in a plane and stay at hotels and I'm laying off police and fire. How does that work? Well, um, I think that kind of tells us the political reality of the world we deal in and that frankly that just isn't going to work. Um, uh, talent, affordable housing, uh, and some political uncertainty are, are the issues that, uh, uh, that we're dealing with. As I indicated, uh, economic development has been under attack. Here are some of the headlines that uh, we're, we have seen in a number of places. Uh, we've talked about uh, uh, those incentives. So we do have to spend a fair amount of time thinking about communicating value. IEDC has put on our website, uh, I, call it, I call it defending economic development, uh, but uh, people who have a better public relations skill than I do, uh, uh, we're trying to turn all those words into positive. We have some, uh, some videos uh, that are available. Uh, we need to tell our story better. We need to find companies that, uh, uh, that have grown as a result of of uh, our activities. We need to find people that have gotten jobs as a result of our activities, and we need to uh, do a better job of articulating our value. Um, and we need to engage more people and educate more people about uh, what we can do. We need to take those metrics that we are starting to use, and we need to tell people uh, um, that uh, what we're doing is achieving real results for our community. So, what have I shared with you today? Um, talent attraction is one of our biggest and most difficult issues that we're dealing with. Um, our top issues are workforce development, entrepreneurship, infrastructure is still a, a huge issue. Community colleges are our best educational partner. Um, we're having to figure out other ways to help uh, our, our companies and their workers, workforce housing being one and we have to figure out the value. Now, if you walk away from this presentation and remember one, only one thing, Indiana in October. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
anywhere 10, 10 miles from a coastline. Now, you guys, the, 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 this was a statistical fluke a little bit in terms of you getting hit. And, uh, you know, if you're on the coastline, you're going to get flooded a little bit more frequently than a, than a tornado la landing in Dayton. So I'm not sure that you have to worry about uh, defending yourself, about companies thinking about not coming to Dayton. My brother lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now that is Tornado Alley. And uh, if you were uh, in a place that had to think about you know, disasters on a regular basis, that's a place that are worried about. Now, uh, the, the other side of, of, of getting the narrative right, though, is what are th what's the economic impact? And, and somebody needs to start tallying it up. Uh, you guys need to, uh, particularly on the political side that I was talking about earlier, you need to kind of figure out what was that economic impact so that as you try to figure out how do we ask the federal government for largesse to help resolve it, what uh, does that look like? So I, I don't think you have anything to be defensive about. I think you need to be a little bit on the offensive and making sure uh, that at, at the very least um, you get your numbers right. And the, the second part is, you know, make sure you're out there talking to your businesses and doing whatever is necessary to make sure that uh, you get your businesses back up and running as quickly as possible. You know, I stayed at the Marriott uh, near the um, University of Dayton last night. They're, they're telling us that we could, shouldn't be drinking the water. You need to get that solved as quickly as possible. Uh, you need to get electricity back up and, uh, as quickly as possible. That's probably the storyline that will haunt you is if you don't respond in that way. Um, th I'll take that one step further. I was in Puerto Rico. Um, probably eight months after the hurricane hit Puerto Rico, there were still sections of the island that did not have electricity. Um, now that's, uh, and you know, th that's malpractice. Don't, don't get there. You know, I almost didn't recognize Steve Stanley when he walked in the room. For those of you who would not know this, I was on the debate team at Ohio University, and there was a guy named Steve Stanley who purported to be a graduate assistant uh, helping us at that particular time in, in life. <laughs> Uh, it has something to do with you, Steve. <laughs> you know, just hanging out with you and, and uh, you know, drinking too much beer, uh, Rolling Rock, I think it was, when we were in Athens, uh, uh, that, that has everything to do with it. <laughs> Mike. In one of your slides, you mentioned workforce housing and affordable housing. Have you seen any, uh, here in, uh, north of here in Sydney, Ohio, we've had some organizations that have actually recruited entire family units out of Puerto Rico worker shortage in the manufacturing community. Have you seen any communities make active investments in actually recruiting people, not just building housing for those that exist? So uh, the answer is absolutely. Now, I, um, you know, Iowa and North Dakota, for some reason or other, tend to lead in most economic recoveries, tend to have some of the lowest unemployment rates uh, in, the, in the country. Frequently, Iowa goes to Michigan uh, to steal workers. Uh, they, they look for uh, um, automobile plants that are closing. And they will go and, and have job fairs. Uh, North Dakota doesn't tend to do as much of that as they do. They mine their high school graduation lists. and. Uh, Many people, when they leave North Dakota, go to the Twin Cities. Uh, I, I, I joke that uh, the reason they go there, go to Minneapolis, St. Paul, versus leaving North Dakota is they think it's warmer there. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, they, uh, but they go and they have job fairs, and they try to recruit people to come home. And, and, and uh, 
people like to return home at certain points in their lives. Their parents start to age, uh, or they have young kids, and they see their their family as you know uh, providing a support system for their family. So there are a whole series of methods that people have used in order to bring in new types of workers. Um, you know, this whole immigration debate is kind of uh, uh, creating some ugliness around, you know, uh, you know, where we get workers. Uh, you know, we have 10 million people running around this country that are undocumented, uh, many of whom are working, um, and, and that, that becomes another opportunity for us if we can figure out th through the politics of that in a way that allows us to uh, bring those people more mainstream. At this point, I, I throw my hands up on that issue and you know, barely want to mention it because I think it's a, a, such a political hot button that we can't go there. Have you seen anywhere around the country that's effectively addressing the problem here? Effectively addressing? Um, I, I don't know if you saw this. Um, you can bid for lunch with Warren Buffett. And the bid this year is $3.5 million to have lunch with Warren Buffett. And, the result, and that money is going into workforce housing in San Francisco. Now, that's a drop in the bucket in San Francisco, obviously. But there are a lot of places that are doing things. That, that's not one of my specialties, is understanding. But we, we are hearing more and more of that uh, going on. Um, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to become too too crazy about this. I'm sure there'll be a session in Indianapolis on, on that whole issue. <laughs> All right, we have one more. Great. 